I've recently done a series of tutorials about connecting one object to a second using several blend methods. When demonstrating the non-destructive approach using the shrink wrap and data transfer modifiers, I received a few comments saying I should have just booleaned the two objects together and then cleaned up the verts. The suggestion being that this would be faster, less complex, and more efficient. Before I move on from this topic, I wanted to do one final video to demonstrate why the Boolean suggestion is not a great choice and why my approach offers superior flexibility. Earlier this year, I did a video where I demonstrated the connection of an eyepiece to the body of a vintage camera using a tedious polygon modeling approach. In part one of this video, I'm going to reconstruct the same region of the camera model, but this time using the shrink wrap and data transfer method to demonstrate the advantages of this approach. In part two, we'll look at applying a seamless bitmap over the connected pieces using a box mapping mechanism. If you've already seen this connection method in my previous videos and only want to see how to apply the seamless bitmap, then just skip to part two. Here's the model and you can see I've disconnected this area. So we're gonna focus on that. What we need to do is come over and quickly look at how the model is structured. It's set up so that we have all of these eyepieces, which are organized into one grouping. And then above that, we've got this main body component. And that sits with inside of another empty controlling all of these parts right here. So let's take both of these components, just the ones we're gonna model, go into isolation mode for these. So the first thing that I wanna do is extend some geometry that the shrink wrap modifier can work on. So we'll come into the front view, tab, two key, double click, E key, and X, and I'm gonna pull out a couple of segments like that, shift R, couple of times. I need to remove these hardened edges. So press shift and E and then minus one to remove those. Okay. And then let's come over making sure pressing the period key that my pivot is at the bounding box of the selection that I have. S key to scale that up. And I'm just going to do it in sort of an arbitrary way, kind of as far up as I think the blend needs to go something about like that. Then let's come in and do sort of the same thing here. S key, and we'll just sort of scale that up. Now let's look at this from the side. I'm gonna move this over a little bit closer to that. I actually think I need one more division. As we look at this from a topology standpoint, this right here, I kind of want it to remain the same because this is a bounding region between this flat linear region here and the area that I want to curve. So I think I actually want to come over here to key. I'm going to press GG and I'm going to add another bevel here. So command B and we'll get just something about like that. So we just need that little bit of extra geometry and then we'll move that in. So let's double click this edge. I'm gonna go into vertex mode. So we'll come over here, click plus, and we're going to call these deform points with the initial weight being at one, and we'll assign these, and then we'll go to this next loop. And I'm gonna bring these down to point nine. So they're mostly affected, but not quite. So there's gonna be a transition. Click assign, and then the next here, let's take these down to a value of 0.6 and assign those there. For now, I'm gonna leave these alone, but we can decide later whether we want to apply just a little bit of a weight to these. And then we need to create the outer boundary, which are the only perimeter points that we want to have the data transfer modifier operate on to transfer normals from the other surface. So we'll click here to create a new vertex group and we'll call these normal transfer something descriptive, make sure this is at a value of one for weight and then assign. So let's come in now and add deform shrink wrap. And we want to use the deform points to restrict there. We know that we want to project them. If you watched my other tutorial and we're going just along the X axis. So we need to specify X 
we want to go in the negative direction. So you see if I hover over the little X right there. So we need to make sure it goes in both the positive and, and negative directions. Do you see how it says subdivision levels here? This is really sort of a precision thing. Let's go ahead and increase this to one. This really makes the projection a little bit more precise internally. It's kind of a subtle thing, but I'll, I'm just going to increase it to one. And then let's come over and finally specify the target, which is this right here, the center body. And let's go ahead and turn on on cage mode so that we can see it acting interactively. Let's come over now and add a subdivision modifier. So we come up to generate subdivision surface. Okay, so there we go. So that's in place. I'm just going to increase it to a value of two. So let's come into the front view and let's just Let's just sort of examine this a little bit more closely to see how it looks to me like it's just a little bit abrupt in the transition. So I want to take this loop that I said we may or may not adjust. And I do think that I want to adjust this a little bit. Let's go into X-ray. We're going to come down back to the deform points vertex group. And we want to assign just a little bit of the weighting to it. So let's do point two and then click assign. And you see how that allowed for just a little bit better transition. Let's leave edit mode and let's also come in into shaded mode. I've got the material applied that we're going to be adding the bump to it. When I was looking at the real object, many reference photos of this real Nizel camera, there was sort of a bumpy grain to it that we're going to be applying using the bitmap method. But to make this more visible as to what's going on, I want to add a temporary material. So we're going to remove that, click new, and I'm just going to call this temp and just a really obvious color to make this obvious. Now, if you look over here, we've got some fringing going on. And if we come back over to the modifier stack, and if we move shrink wrap under subdivision, it will actually give us a better result. And the reason for that is let's go tab into edit mode is because these original loops that we had given vertex assignments to, when we generate a subdivision surface, the generated geometry gets assigned the same weighting, albeit with a gradation for each of the generated subdivision loops as a transition between the values that we've assigned for each of these. And the shrink wrap modifier still modifies those. So this actually works in our benefit to do it this way. So let's leave edit mode and let's apply that same temporary material here. And we're going to add our data transfer. Okay, we need to make sure it is a well actually let's do it below auto smooth now auto smooth has it's pinned to the bottom we want this to be the last thing that really gets modified in terms of the normal so i don't want anything coming after it so let's come down and i'm not going to specify source yet i want to sort of get everything set up so the vertex group that we want to restrict the operation to is the normal transfer vertices and then we're going to come down to where it says the face corner data, which is where we grab custom normals. And we're going to set it to the projected face interpolated mode. So let's rotate around so we can maybe see this a little bit better. I've also found that this also tends to work better in perspective mode. So just take note of that, that when you're in orthographic mode, you get more of these artifacts. So let's go into perspective where we can clearly see that boundary. So let's come in now and specify the actual object, which is the main center body. And there we go. You could see the normals get transferred and we that disappears. Okay, so now that we've gotten that set up, we're ready to apply the seamless bumpy texture. Let's go ahead now and reassign the original material that I had. So we're going to come over black. It's the center black body. Sign that there. Black center black body. Okay. So let's pull up texture editing. I'm just going to bring up the shading editor here. And with one of these selected, let's turn overlays back on. We could go and add a procedural texture for doing bump maps. That works pretty well. But, you know, sometimes what if you've got a custom generated bitmap of some sort? So let's do A, 
image texture we're going to open up and I've generated a surface noise bitmap. In fact, let's come over and do a vertical split here. And then we can see in the image editor, and we'll just bring that up. Let's do noise, surface noise. So we've got that done. Now, if we come over here and we just do a shift and control on here and we look at it, it gives us nonsensical results because internally it's trying to apply this in UV mode and we really don't have UV set up for this. So let's go ahead and collapse that. With this node selected, press Control T to add a texture setup. So you can see it's automatically defaulted to UVs. We're gonna go back down to object here and we're gonna see that it does something. But remember, the key with object when you're trying to sync up two objects is that you wanna make sure that both have the same scale. In this case, both of my objects are 1.0, and because I'm in local, I can also determine that both have the same local orientation. So that's important. So now we can just come down here and we can start playing with this and getting sort of the scale in place. We can sort of figure out what the scale is. In fact, I think maybe 25, I like 25, but it's projecting down. We've got this clear uh, stretching of the texture. So this is where we come over and we look at the image texture node itself. And we can see that this texture is being applied just in a projection mode. And what we wanna do is change it. But the first thing that we're gonna note when you look carefully is we can see the border of our primary object that we're sort of focusing on here. We can see the seam right there. So if we come over and we change this, to a box project mode, well, then we don't get that stretching. But when you look carefully, we're getting better. We're getting a lot better. You can see that there are seams showing up because it's as if it's put a box around and each of the faces are projecting onto the object. Well, let's look here. You can see that we've got these seams coming together come down to where it says blend here and just start driving this up and watch those blend away. It's like magic. Now we've got the final seam between the two different objects that we're working with that we can see kind of, it looks like kind of a tear between these two objects and we want to get rid of that. We have a primary empty that is the parent of all the objects that we've been working on. We can use that as the center for the projection of the box texture on both objects. So we take the eyedropper down here and we select that and there it goes. We've gotten rid of that tear, the seam that was there and everything is seamless between the two different objects. Let's reconnect all of this, drive this into the bump and the principal BSDF back into material output. And there we go. So let's go ahead now and jump into the main scene. And we'll take a look at this really significant benefit of this approach by coming to the eyepiece empty for all of these components. Look at that. By moving this up and down, we can easily reposition that. And all of those details of connection are taken care of for us. So anyway, I hope you found this to be a useful tutorial.